Hi, I'm Pavel Bichkov, I'm a historian and a postgraduate student from Moscow. Maybe you are aware of some uh, aspects of Russian history, but today I want to talk about uh, a sphere that is mostly unknown in the West. I want to walk you through the evolution of the image of European Middle Ages in Soviet Russia and through the changes of its interpretation I want to show how changed the culture of Soviet Union. This is what I may call Soviet medievalism. And along with it I want to walk you through the uh, cold streets of Moscow. Yes, that's also me and it's very cold out outside so brace yourself. Okay, then let's begin. After the revolution in 1917 and civil war, history was viewed as non-existent subject. The Bolsheviks were sure that the new history began in this year and you shouldn't study or teach at school anything that happened before. But in the 1930s those arguments were renounced after Stalin became the sole leader of Soviet Union. Science, especially history, was seen now as a ideological instrument for the Communist Party. The Marxist-Leninist dogma said that during the ancient and medieval eras slavery and feudalistic system were predominant in social and cultural aspects of life. Soviet historiography and literature were constructing and promoting the Dark Ages myth about oppressive and religious medieval society, with the Inquisition and impoverished peasantry, but sometimes this weapon could be turned against the government and Soviet ideology itself. This happened after the death of Stalin in 1953 and Khrushchev's thought, the period of destalinization of relative liberalization of cultural life. Poets and writers started to critique the government, such figures as Solzhenitsyn and Sakharov began to raise their voice. For those who wrote, not only for the general public, but for the free thinkers of Soviet underground, the image of violent medieval society became the symbol, the allegory of Soviet state. In 1964, two young sci-fi writers, Arkady and Boris Strugatsky, published a novel Hard to be a God. The main hero, Anton or Don Romata, is uh, in this novel an undercover agent from Earth, who tries to save educated and creative individuals from repressions on a medieval cruel planet. Initially, this novel was meant to be more light-hearted and adventurous, just like the novels of Dumas. But after the Manesh affair in 1962, where Khrushchev critiqued avant-garde artists, the plot was changed by Strugatsky to reflect a more somber, more pessimistic view on the relations between government and an individual. This was because the Khrushchev's thaw was ending and the new era of Brezhnevian stagnation was coming. The antagonist in Hard to be a God is the state, represented by Prime Minister Don Reba, which was named Rebia in the first drafts, an obvious parallel with Lavrentia Beria, the former KGB leader. The fabricated cases about royal poisonings in the novel are also reference to the Doctor's plot, the last of Stalin's purges. But the main focus of the narrative of the novel is the main character, Don Romata. He is a brave knight who resembles a dissident who helps others to flee the country. He is smart, he is lonely and morally superior to the inhabitants of this semi-totalitarian medieval state. This correlates with a trope describing a dissident and a member of so-called intelligentsia, and, and uh, this trope is commonly used in literature, cinema and non-fiction. For example, you may know the uh, Tarkovsky's work Andrei Rublev, where a dissident Rublev is placed in a medieval era. Russian philosopher and writer Grigory Pomeranz in his 1981 essay would compare uh, modern dissidents to the free-thinking heroes of the past, particularly to Joan of Arc and Giordano Bruno. Another Soviet poet and dissident Yuli Kim would picture a chaotic character in his 1980 song Lonely Night. 
The main theme of this song is that the fighting is in vain with a force that is bigger than the hero, but this fact doesn't make him give up, and another obvious parallel to the dissident. This is a fragment of this song. Strugatsky brothers in their novel How to be a God depicted a colorful image of a dissident, someone who is thinking otherly. This is the literal translation of Russian term inakomyslie, descent. This image will haunt other creators in my country for years. For example, if you are a fan of art house movies, you can watch a film adaptation of this novel How to be a God by Alexei German, who was a dissident himself. But Strugatsky brothers in the novel also propose an alternative. Authoritarian Arkanar is surrounded by the different alternative countries, San and Irukan. Though being medieval, they are more enlightened and give shelter to Arkanar dissidents. The concept introduces the other Soviet point of view on European Middle Ages. It is not only the territory of an oppressive state, but also it represents something exotic, mysterious and unknown West with the capital W. Russian history didn't have a medieval period, the official term was ancient Rus, so Middle Ages were associated strictly with Europe. Dark Ages, where everything is controlled by church and government, and this medieval West, the unknown and the country of freedom, were two interpretations that coexisted and conflicted in unofficial Soviet culture. The medieval West was represented for Soviet people by the Baltic region. They were shot most commonly known Soviet historical and fantasy movies. Widely popular was Scott's Ivanhoe that was printed in USSR multiple times, so there was a romanticized view on that historical period among the reading public. Also, medieval heritage gave young poets an opportunity to support themselves through literary translation of medieval and medievalistic European literature. Poets that weren't allowed in Soviet Writers' Union had to earn for living by translating medieval and Renaissance authors. Many of these poets and writers were banned in Soviet print, so there were only two ways they could express themselves apart from the translation – Tamizdat and Samizdat, self-printed underground press outside Tamizdat and inside Samizdat, Soviet Union. Specifically through the Samizdat, Soviet readers would find out about the birth of a new genre of fantasy novels. Clive Staples Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia were translated and self-published in 1970s in the congregation of Alexander Men, famous Orthodox writer and preacher. The main translator was Natalia Trauberg, who was a Catholic and lived in the Baltic region, in Lithuania. Previously, she translated mostly Catholic writers for Soviet publishers. Among those were Graham Greene, Paul Gallagher and Gilbert Keith Chesterton. Catholicism was another element of medievalistic imagery in Soviet culture. It was an exotic system of beliefs associated with Lithuania, Poland and Czechoslovakia, the near abroad. 1970s popular Yuri Visber's song Catholic Church, dedicated to his uh, loved one, the cult Soviet actress Alla Demidova, a devout Catholic, described Catholic women as tantalizing and completely mysterious. Here's a little bit of this song. Katolichka, не простая, а загадочная, сплошь назидательно листает католическую ложь. Назидательно листает католическую ложь. For Orthodox and Catholic believers, Narnia was not only a fantasy, a fairy tale, but a Christian parable an important apologetic weapon against the atheistic propaganda of Soviet uh, government. At the same time, Narnia was a closet land, a very compelling metaphor of escapism and inner immigration in authoritarian culture of Soviet Union. 
Not accidentally, the translator of another classic fantasy novel, Vladimir Muravyov, was also a Catholic and also related to the dissident movement. He had the idea of translating Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings since 1974. Later he found himself a co-translator, Andrei Kistikovsky, who was also a censored translator and a very public anti-Soviet political activist. He translated Arthur Kersler's novel Darkness at Noon, that was published in Samizdat and in Tamizdat. Due to translation of anti-totalitarian novel, Kistikovsky was banned from Writers' Union. Meanwhile, in the 70s, Tolkien started to accumulate a cult following in USSR. In 1977, first proper translation of The Lord of the Rings by Grusberg started to circulate in Samizdat. In the same year, Tolkien fandom was born. Young philologist Sergei Koshlev wrote a graduation work in the 70s about the Lord of the Rings and made a translation of its two chapters. Studying in Moscow, Koshlev and his friends gathered to discuss the novel and difficulties of its translation, and in a while they became obsessed with the lore of the book. Thus, the first Tolkien fandom in the 1980s aroused in the Moscow State University. The most significant thing that Koshlev is known in this community is his song The Road Goes Ever On that he wrote in 1980s on Tolkien's verses. Soviet music was another area where one could find medievalistic motives in it. In 1970 the label Melodia released an album loot music of 16th-17th centuries. There were late medieval melodies like Turdion, Galliard or Grain Sleeves. Other compositions were attributed to different Renaissance and Baroque composers. But all of them were actually written by an outsider Russian composer and musician Vladimir Vavilov, a lute enthusiast. Knowing that an album of archaic and religious music wouldn't be released under his name, he wasn't a member of Soviet Composers' Union, he perpetuated a hoax. Nobody knew about it uh, at the time. He died in 1973 and his mystification would live on and only be revealed in 2000s. The album gathered a cult status. The main joke about bringing your date home at the time would be would you like to listen with me to late music of 16th century at my place? One composition would gather even international fame due to Latvian opera singer Inessa Galante. It's uh, Ave Maria, you may know uh, this piece from the movie Donnie Darko. Vavilov's melodies became popular not only among music lovers, but also among general public through the newborn rock scene. In 1972, young poets and underground artists Andrei Volochonsky and Alexei Khvastenko would write a song on Vavilov's melody. The name of the song was A Darling Was Carried Away by a Horse, and it would become popular among Russian bards and rock musicians. Another song written by this duo on Vavil's melody is The City of Gold. It would become in 1970s part of the repertoire of first Soviet rock band Aquarium. City of Gold would also be their most well-known hit in Perestroika in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. 
Она твоя, о ангел мой, она твоя всегда. Aquarium also recorded in 1981 two pieces on their album Triangle, an instrumental composition Guinever with Celtic motives and a song called Death of King Arthur, which consisted of the lyrics from Mallory's poem. Aquarium's interest in medievalistic motives wasn't phenomenal. We can see the same tendencies in visual art of the 70s too. Soviet artist Dmitry Zhelinsky created in 1973 a painting Sunday, which was unusual. It's a tempera on the wood, and also visually it reminds one of Botticelli's Uccellus or Van Eyck's works. But the opposite representation of Middle Ages as something dark, scary and oppressive can also be found in the music and poetry of the early 80s. For example, formed in 1978, first Soviet Gothic rock band Picnic was named after one of the Strugatsky novels. You may know the screen adaptation of this novel, it's Andrei Tarkovsky's Stalker. Picnic released their second album, Wolf's Dance, in 1984, on which a song was featured by the name of Inquisitor. The somber lyrics told the story of a man tortured by a Grand Inquisitor, demanding his victim to confess him all thoughts and secrets. The song was created during the leadership of Yuri Andropov, the former chairman of KGB, who in 1983 started so-called anti-loitering campaign. During it, many Soviet rock musicians, artists and dissidents were prosecuted. Uh, such political climate in early 1980s actualized again the Dark Ages myth in poetry and music. By a coincidence, the author of the song, Edmund Shklarsky, was from a Polish heritage and also a Catholic, which might have inspired the main themes of this song. In the late 80s, Finally, people were given some political and creative freedom. The first official translation of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings was published. It was made by Muravyov and Kistikovsky. So, the first Tolkien's fandoms appeared in big cities. As you can see, the different interpretations of medievalism, the negative ones and the romanticized, were born in our culture in the 20th century. The modern-day Russian medievalism is even more diversified and complex, so it's a theme of another mini-lecture. As for today, that'll be all. Thank you for watching and following me in this journey. Goodbye.